to watch it so closely. Where is it? 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 Hello everyone and welcome to the Diploma and Smartphone Photography course. Uh, but okay guys, if you do have any, any trouble at all while you're watching the webinars, first thing to do is close down any other apps that you might have open and maybe close down any other internet pages that you have streaming, okay? So any of that might interfere with your internet connection. Certainly well worthwhile looking at your internet speed. Worst comes to worst, log out and log back in again, and that usually resolves the majority of problems. Worst comes to worst, if you're really having an awful lot of trouble, we do record all the lessons, and you can catch up with those um, the next day. But I'll explain all of that. Look, predominantly, well, look, let me introduce myself before we go too much further. Um, my name is Caroline. I am one of the educators here at Show Academy. I know I'm seeing quite a few familiar names from the, the UPP course. It's another one I teach here at Show Academy, as well as the wedding photography course. I had taught that one in the past. Uh, basically, I have studied photography for years, and I've been working in the industry for well over 10 years now. I've done a huge amount of traveling, which has given me some amazing photo opportunities. So. That's using a number of different camera types and different devices along the way. So I'm very, very excited to be teaching this course, and I certainly think it's going to be an awful lot of fun. And very, very, I'm very, very passionate about helping students improve their photography, no matter what your areas of interest are, and indeed, no matter what camera or what device you are using. Uh, that is me and that is Shaw Academy. But look, just to give you an idea, because I know there's going to be lots of questions coming in about what we will be covering in the other lessons. So I'm going to give you a quick outline, a quick basic outline of the, the course, okay? If you want more details on any of this, you can go to our website and we have a lot more details on it. But basically the course is divided into eight lessons, all absolutely jam-packed with information. So each lesson is basically basically a bit of a stepping stone and you're going to gain an awful lot of knowledge from each lesson to the next. And the aim is to equip you with a solid foundation of photographic skills that are going to allow you to take advantage of your smartphone cameras, okay? And so it'll help you take your smartphone photography to the next lesson. So lesson one, we're going to discuss styles of photography and basically I want you to, to think about what style would you like to try out. Lesson two is going to be an absolute whistle stop tour through the history of photography, very, very brief tour uh, of the history of photography. So we do understand how it all came about and then we're going to move on to talk about how your camera sees and how you can adapt our, our camera's view of the world. Lesson three in week two, we're going to talk about composition. So simple guidelines that make a massive, massive difference to your photographs. Lesson four, we're going to start looking at a bit more of the technical side of it. So we're going to start looking at motion and depth in your images and how we can control this. So with shutter speeds and apertures and focus points. And again, this is where you're going to really begin to build your creative visions as well as beginning to understand how to take control of your exposures. Lesson five then in week three, we're going to start looking at selfies and portraiture, okay? I don't think we could get away with doing a smartphone photography course without looking at this. Um, so basically giving you ideas and techniques for better selfies, but then also how to take better portraits in general. But can I ask you guys, who, who does like doing selfies? Um, but lesson six then, guys, is going to be an incredibly important lesson for you. This is where we're really going to get into the nitty gritty and take full control over your exposure. So this is where you're really going to become a master with your smartphone photography. So it's, it's not only taking control of your creative vision, but also creating consistent images that are well exposed and you can be much more confident going out there knowing you're going to get it right every single time because you're you're going to have a much, much better understanding of what's going on inside your camera. Lesson seven in week four, again, another very, very important one because, you know, smartphone photography, you know, taking the photo itself is actually only half the story. The other half is sharing your images. So in that lesson, we're going to look at different social medias and how to get the most out of them. 
Lesson eight then, um, like obviously with the advancements in technology, it does mean it's very, very easy to miss just how creative enhancements can, can, can bring your photography to the next level, okay? There's a massive amount that you can do just on your smartphones. You don't need to be bringing them onto a PC or a Mac. You can do a huge amount on your smartphone. So essentially, um, lesson eight, very, very important. You're going to learn how to perfect and enhance every image, okay? How to correct faults and then even do a little bit of retouching as well, okay? So throughout, guys, we're going to have a little bit of a mix of kind of dipping in and out the technical, but then we're going to be mixing it up with some lighter lessons like uh, the composition lesson and the, the selfie or portraiture lesson. So it'll be a real, real mix for you guys, okay? And yeah, Salaya, it's two lessons every week, okay? Um, but all right, guys, look, uh, let me just say at this point, you know, Every student here has taken your first step towards achieving your objectives. Just by showing up today and attending the lessons, you're taking control and you're already on the path to creating better photography, okay? So guys, look, to achieve this success, it's very, very simple. Just keep showing up to the lessons and I promise you by the end of it, your knowledge will grow absolutely massively, okay? But phew, okay, <laughs> let's get started into the lesson itself, okay? so. Before I, I, I'd start getting into the, the, the nitty gritty, just want to say why you would develop your knowledge of this subject of smartphone photography. So I always like to do a little section of why. Just helps you put everything into perspective in terms of what you do know already, but more importantly, what you need to know going forward. So this course will help you develop and enhance your creative skills help you expand your technical knowledge and build confidence in your abilities and also it'll help you develop a vocabulary in the subject that you love okay so um very very simple without those skills and that knowledge you're not going to be able to take full advantage of all the new features that smartphones do offer and you'll never gain the abilities to to make strong consistent images every single time you go out photographing and then, and then you're never going to quite know what the, what results the camera is going to produce okay or why it's giving you these results but having more control over your camera will then help you fulfill your creative vision and certainly allow you to expand it as well okay uh, Rebbe, you're asking what's the site? It's shawacademy.com. I'll give you that address again towards the end. But look, during the course, you're going to gain a huge amount of knowledge. By the time you finish this one, you're going to be able to take fantastic photos with your smartphone. Did many of you get a chance to look at the slideshow I was playing before the lesson? Yeah, a few people did. That's all students' work from last month. So it gives you a bit of a sense of, of the type of work they were able to achieve by the end, okay? Um, but look, photography, one thing I'd always say about photography, it's, it's, it's always been considered a people's art. But now smartphones have finally allowed us to achieve the ideal of people, people having a camera with them all of the time and that gives them the freedom to create and edit and share their photographs really really quickly and very very easily and sharing is obviously quite a big part of the smartphone camera experience and many many people use their phones they can instantly share images they take on them they can share them on social media with friends and families but why, I mean a lot of people will ask why do a specialised mobile photography course? We do have an introduction to photography course as well, so you know why would we be doing this one? Well like I say, you know, photography is an absolute passion for many, many people and we're constantly surrounded by images of some kind, whether or not they're professional images or just those on social media by friends and family. And I mean would you guys like to take a guess um, at what percentage of photos are expected to be taken by smartphones by 2017? Take a guess guys. Okay, actually, <laughs> one or two people have actually got this right. Guys, it's estimated that 80% of photographs will be taken with smartphone cameras by 2017, which I think is absolutely incredible. To be honest, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if it does surpass that. <laughs> Dave, you got it right. You're saying, what a guess, lol. <laughs> but no, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it does surpass it. Um, but it is estimated that about 80% of photographs will be taken 
in our smartphones. So it'll absolutely incredible. So when you think that the vast majority of smartphones are going to be taken with them, sorry, smartphone photographs, a vast majority of photographs will be taken with smartphones, then it's absolutely, absolutely makes sense to learn a little bit more about the increasingly advanced features on your phone. And honestly, smartphone cameras are becoming better and better. It's an incredibly competitive market at the moment. But like the most expensive professional cameras, if you don't know how to use your camera and make the most of your features, well, then you're not going to produce consistent and great results. Okay, so this course is going to teach you all of those skills, but that's not all. It's only, you know, much of what you learn will still be relevant to photography generally. So if you do decide to take your interest in photography further, or if you do have DSLR cameras already, this course will still provide you with a solid foundation that will allow you to build build on for your photography in general, okay? And yeah, Shanice, you're asking will this lesson work with Samsung Galaxies? Yeah, honestly guys, I don't care what devices you are using. My aim, I know you guys probably are going to have an incredibly, you know, lots and lots of different types of phones. That's absolutely fine, okay? I'm going to be teaching you the principles of photography, and then we're going to be introducing different apps that you can use to unlock different features. So don't worry, no matter what you're using, you will be able to, to use it better by the end of the course. But all right, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about different styles of photography and I think it's one of the keys to being a good photographer is to actually combine your photography with other interests and that means you're photographing something that you're already interested in and that's going to give you a deeper understanding of the subject or maybe access to um, to events or specialist knowledge or locations that might not be available to others and that will inevitably lead to better photographs okay and even though we're aware of the rapid growth of technology it is still quite surprising just how many styles of photography can be undertaken really really successfully with smartphones Okay, so guys, these are going to, it's a list basically of all the different types of styles that we're going to be looking at very, very briefly today, okay? There is more out there, and if you really wanted to, you could break these down even further. You could get really, really niche about it, but look, for the sake of not keeping your hair all day, we're just going to look at these ones. And one thing that I'd say is really, really important this is just to give you a few ideas of what's out there, but never feel like you have to choose just one style or that you can never cross over, okay? To be honest, an awful lot of these do naturally overlap. I mean, for example, I, um, I'd regularly take portraits or landscapes while doing travel photography. Or, you know, if I was doing wedding, uh, a wedding shoot, I'd quite regularly do a candid style of shots and so on, okay? So there is quite a lot of overlap here, okay? Um, but all right, guys, portraits. I think certainly portraits, um, it's one of the most popular styles of photography out there. You know, no matter whether or not it's a casual shot of somebody while you're just living your life and going about your your day-to-day -day business or it could be a, a more formal studio shot either way these do get more precious as time passes and portraits do offer an incredible opportunity for creativity um, and certainly like i say lesson five we're going to devote an entire lesson to portrait photography and, and selfies okay and that's going to leave you absolutely itching to, to try out your new skills Self-portraits as well, it, you know, it, it's one of the portrait styles that's probably the most unique to mobile phone photography, and that's the selfie, okay? So we're going to look at a few ideas and techniques that you could try. Um, I mean, you know, like these examples, you can see, you know, most selfies are probably taken with the camera held at arm's length, or maybe with a selfie stick. But there is lots of creative opportunities and a lot of fun ideas and to be honest a lot of apps that you could explore as well. And since self-portraits, that's their, their proper name, self-portraits, they have actually been around for centuries so it is always worth a look back to see if there's anything that you could use today. Uh, landscape photography, um, certainly I think it's safe to say we're all influenced by our surroundings and it is quite natural to want to capture a really beautiful scene which again I think is why landscape photography is, is one of the, the favourite styles for many, many people. So it could be on holiday where all the sites are new and exciting 
or it might be a place that we see every day, you know, suddenly just transformed by, by really, really beautiful kind of unique lighting. And although we do use the word landscape, you know, you might get, get a, a mental image like what you see on screen now with rolling fields and mountains. It could actually be much more varied than that. It could be a seascape or it could be a, a gritty urban cityscape um, that you'd be more interested in. So it really doesn't matter what kind of landscape you want to shoot. Smartphone cameras do really, really lend themselves to photographing them very well. Another key area of smartphone photography is food photography. And can I ask you guys, how many, how many of you are guilty of this one? How many of you have photographed your fancy meals to show off your handiwork? <laughs> or maybe if you're out at a fancy restaurant. <laughs> Everybody's saying guilty. Oh yes, too guilty. <laughs> Christian, you're saying obviously. <laughs> Brilliant. And look, I mean, this is obviously a uh, specialization of professional photographers as well, you know, producing really... Uh, mouth-watering images for magazines and, and different books and using you know creative colorful different compositions to attract the attention from the viewer but again it is interesting to see the way this area of photography has become so popular with smartphone photographers I think one of the main attractions is probably the fact that it's kind of like stumbling across a beautiful landscape food is very often presented in such a um, an almost camera ready way that it is actually hard to resist that urge to take a photograph so it's a very very popular one um, another area I think smartphones handle really really well is uh, close-up photography um, and again I think what you know one of photography's attractions is been able to direct our viewers attention uh, to something that's taken an interest uh, you know taken an interest of the photographer and close-up photography takes that even further so this is an area um, that's all about focusing in on details maybe colors and different shapes and presenting a viewpoint that you wouldn't always normally see and certainly while flowers would be a very popular subject Anything can, can become quite interesting. So maybe an old watch or toys or jewelry. To be like like I say, almost anything could make an interesting shot when you're getting in really nice and close. And you know, it might sound really, really obvious, but this is about getting in as close as possible. So whether it's basically get the closest point that your smartphone will still be able to focus at for the biggest impact. And sometimes moving so close that the subject becomes unrecognizable and abstract can be a really fun thing to try as well. Okay, thanks. So, Leia, you're asking an interesting question there. You're saying, could you be a professional photographer with just a smartphone? Uh, look, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through, but there is examples of, smart, of, of professional photographers using smartphones. Um, so, it's an interesting debate, but it will be kind of I think, definitely, definitely pushed more and more. And now guys, travel photography, um, again, you know, one of the best opportunities to take photographs is while you're traveling and, you know, it's not just that the location is new and different, very often your own mindset opens up and becomes more inquisitive and uh, certainly not much more adventurous, you know, sometimes a whole new world will open up and different places will have their own unique energy as well. And certainly in a city, take photographs during the rush hour or late at night when the, the lights come on and the, the city might come to life. It's got a very different feel to it. Um, you know, the opposite might apply to an unspoiled wilderness. Maybe, you know, an all-night hike to capture the light at dawn, maybe with the mist kind of burning off as the sun is rising. It might be a, a more appropriate way to capture its essence. So always, always worth exploring different times. Um, to photograph different locations. Sports photography. So, I mean, do many of you guys do much sports photography? I know certainly when you, you might see photographers at sporting events, they might, you know, you, you will notice they'll have big massive telephoto lenses and you, you know, you might guess at that point maybe your smartphone has uh, met its match. But, you know, I'd say for some sports situations that is true. But not it's it, but it's not a problem to know the limitations of your camera either. But if you are interested in sports, there's still a fair amount that you can do with your smartphones. If you're in any situation where there's good enough light and you can get in quite close, there's a good chance of getting some great shots. Now, sports they are typically fast moving uh, subjects, often very very fast moving objects. 
a mar most smartphones do have a burst mode, which is a, is perfect for capturing fast moving subjects. I'll talk about that one later on in tonight's lesson. That will help you a lot. And somebody who was asking before, is there any professional photographers using smartphones? There is a great example. Two thousand in two thousand and twelve, a photographer called Dan Chung. So Dan Chung, C H U N G. He shot the Olympics in London using his iPhone 4. He also used Canon binoculars and then the Snapseed app, which we're going to be looking at in lesson eight. And his results were absolutely fantastic. So absolutely fantastic examples of some good smartphone photography uh, shooting a, a sports event. So, um, you know, if, if I hadn't told you that they were done on an iPhone, you probably never would know. So it certainly can be done if you understand how to use your equipment well. You know, there is quite a lot you can do. Again, there's other photographers. Um, Nick was it Nick Knight? He did a campaign for Diesel on his, uh, I think it was on his iPhone as well. So there is examples, but it really, really is a case of understanding your equipment. Um, but all right, guys, architectural photography. Um, again, smartphones are actually quite good for doing architect architectural shots because um, these are constantly improving. So the images are going to look pretty good straight out of your phone. How you doing? Doing pretty and good then it is possible to make them even better. Um, now, most professional photographers who specialize in architecture, they might use an expensive tilt shift lens. It's, like I say, quite, quite expensive and involves quite a massive amount of technical knowledge to use them. But you can actually have a similar amount of control over your smartphone photos um, through editing apps. You can correct uh, some of the common problems you'll get with, uh, you know, with your standard, standard cameras. Um, things like converging verticals, um, you can correct them using a transform tool um, as a perspective correction tool designed with architecture in mind. Now, likewise, guys, I will be talking about that one in lesson eight. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure to, uh, to, to join us on that one. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, street photography as well. Um, um, but street photography, okay, again, another very, very popular style of photography. And again, a perfect match with smartphone photography because we do typically carry our phones everywhere. And while you might be lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, sometimes street photography can actually require an awful lot of patience, okay? One of the fundamental principles of photography is a thing called the decisive moment. Has anybody heard of this before, that expression? This is attributed to one of the pioneers of street photography, a photographer called Henry Cartier-Bresson. Highly, highly recommend taking a look at his work. Beautiful, beautiful work. And he gave a brilliant description of the decisive moment in 1957. He described it as being that creative fraction of a second where you're taking a picture your eye must see a composition or an expression that life itself offers you. And you must know with intuition when to click the camera. And that is the that is a moment the photographer is creative. And once you miss it, it's gone forever. And so he described that as the, the decisive moment. And it's very important to bear that in mind. Like I say, you might be lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, but very often patience uh, is very very important too you know seeing all these different elements come together you know photography is much more than just a technical skill like there is also that composition and then just an awareness of what's going on and night photography another styles uh, that I want to talk about tonight um, and certainly you will notice no matter where you are in the world whether it's landscapes cityscapes uh, once darkness finally falls you know moonlight or brightly lit buildings, cityscapes, they all kind of get a magical kind of otherworldly look to your photographs. And again, in this scene, the reflections of the water make the scene even more dazzling. And there certainly is a few handy tips um, that will help you be very, take very, very successful nighttime photography. We'll talk about those uh, throughout a number of different lessons. Um, it's really a case of taking control of your settings and understanding what's happening to avoid all of the common problems. 
concert and event photography um, again it's I think it's really important as photographers to be on the lookout for events in your areas that could have good potential for photographs so you know whether or not it's music gigs with, with incredible light shows that can make great photos um, you know try and get in nice and close avoid using that zoom feature we'll talk about that in later lessons um, but again no matter what your interests are whether it's music or it could be different cultural events it is a great way of combining um, you know your interest in photography with other areas that you're passionate about I think that's always a very very uh, fantastic way to um, take incredible photographs um, drone or aerial photography um, you know until very very recently this was actually out of reach for an awful lot of photographers if you know this type of, of, of work had required expensive helicopters or cherry pickers um, so it made it a very exclusive area of photography but now drones have opened up that restricted style to everyone and as much fun as aerial photography can be there's also fantastic practical applications of this as well especially if you're interested in retail sales or property sales uh, you can show the property and the surrounding area or it might just give you a whole other perspective or a completely different viewpoint on otherwise familiar objects or landscapes or landmarks. I've seen an awful lot of amazing aerial or drone photography um, but pushed out for uh, tourism and travel photography, so promoting different locations. Um, documentary, another very popular area of photography. Sometimes when people hear the term documentary photography, they think, you know, about well-known photographers and maybe the National Geographic. But this is actually an area of photography that absolutely anybody can do. All this really is, is a collection of images that tell a story. You can document absolutely anything. So, you know, like when people take a photograph of themselves or maybe their child every day for a year um, or every year of their lives, that can become a, a documentary project. Or maybe, you know, you photograph a day in the life of somebody who works in an industry that maybe other people might be interested in, but actually rarely see. But the principle of documentary photography is that the individual image should say something or reveal an aspect about the subject, but then all these images should come together to tell a story and give a better overview of your subject. So it's shown a much more complete story. Concept photography. Now, again, another kind of interesting one. Um, so very often, you know, good photo photographs can tell a story. And sometimes it could be a really simple story. Maybe it's a true story. But then other times it could be much more elaborately staged. It could be a completely fictional image that might have more in common with a process of making a movie. So I mean, can I ask you guys, have you ever read something and, and had a, or maybe even seen a movie and been inspired? Have you ever kind of formed a picture in your mind about how that would look? And that's what con conceptual photography can be. It's about photographing something that doesn't necessarily exist. Yeah, a lot of people say they do all the time. That's great. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to exist. It could just be an idea that you have to tell a fictional story just like any author or any writer or any filmmaker might do you know they might do it with books and photography or books or films and photographers can be equally creative okay we don't always have to be telling something that's true to life we could be completely making up fictional worlds as well but one thing i would say about smartphone photography it is developing a uh, style in and of itself so you know again if we kind of look back to maybe the 60s and professional photographers started switching from those big large and medium format cameras they switched from them to 35 millimeter SLR cameras and the style of photography changed significantly then so it moved from that kind of quite stiff formal style that had gone before replaced by a more much more exciting kind of vibrant sense of freedom that reflected the the huge shift in popular culture and smartphone photog uh, cameras now have actually generated an, a new style of everyday photography so it's really taken that a step further and these are shots of kind of routine random daily life or then again mixed in with kind of extraordinary moments of your life as well um, and these wouldn't always necessarily be taken if we didn't have a smartphone with us um, there's always an absolute chance that you'll stumble on, onto an absolute killer shot 
but these casual throwaway shots that you can take quite easily and quickly without even really thinking about it they do represent a different style in and of itself as well and these are shots that they might not have been deemed important enough to take with any other kind of camera certainly not with film photography because it costs you so much with film photography but digital photography and smartphone photography certainly just lessening that 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 kind of thought process it's really really changed it and certainly over time they can build up quite a unique diary of images that reflect the time that you live in as well and the other kind of grab shots that would really only be taken on a smartphone uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a theme but the random nature of the shots kind of hold them together as well. So guys, can I ask you at this point, I know that's kind of a, a, a really quick run through, but I mean, is there a style that you would like to master or is any of them a style that you feel you're already photographing? Guys, look, like I said, as, uh, said at the beginning, that's a small little taster of different styles. There's lots and lots more. And like I say, you could maybe kind of break them down even further if you want to get into nitty gritty. But like I say, if I was to go into every single style, I'd have you here all night. And there is actually a little bit more that I want to, to get into as well. Okay, so I'm going to run through this little bit as well quite quickly, guys, if you don't mind. Um, but look, I want to talk a little bit about smartphone cameras themselves and the different functions and different features. Um, now, don't worry if the examples I'm using, if they're not the same as a smartphone you have. Honestly, the, the, the functions that I'm going to be talking about, they are common on majority of smartphones. And if they're not, I can talk to you about how you might be able to unlock these features on your own phones. Um, you're not going to have every single feature, and if you don't, don't worry. It's just to get everybody familiar with the different options that may be available to you guys, okay? And like I say, the features and the way they're laid out, they're, they're broadly the same, but they will vary slightly from one smartphone to another, okay? And for that reason, one thing I will absolutely say to you, maybe at the end of this lesson, see if you can Google your type of smartphone and see if you can find the manual or the instructions for your smartphone, okay? You very rarely get them included with your smartphones anymore, but you can usually download a PDF pretty easily, okay? So guys, really, really will help you. If you can't quite find the features I'm talking about, make sure to download this and it really, really will help you locate them, okay? Um, and like I say, don't worry if you don't have every single feature. Um, they might be called different names, but we'll be running through. We will certainly. Cal, if you, I can see your comments, okay? Um, like I say, it's kind of a, a general overview, and I think majority of you will be absolutely fine with it. But look, I can certainly kind of help you further if needs be. So, okay, so here's your standard iPhone. Um, standard kind of features from your power button, your, your headphone socket, home button, and, and lightning connector. But a couple that I want to point out to you. First of all, your front-facing camera, okay? So that's on the front of the camera or on your phone, and that's what you'd use for taking selfies, Snapchat, Skype, and FaceTime. But on the back of your camera, there is a rear-facing camera as well, okay? And it's important to point out because typically that actually has a higher resolution. So that will typically produce a higher quality image than the front-facing camera, okay? And then next to that, you have the LED or the flashlight. Again, can be quite handy uh, in, in smartphone photography, but we'll talk about that a little bit um, before we finish the lesson. The volume or the zoom button, okay, a lot of you might not know, um, you can actually set your volume button to act as a zoom button as well. You might need to unlock this feature, but majority of iPhones do allow this, okay? You can also set your power button to act as a shutter release on your camera, and that can be very, very handy um, when you're taking photographs. It can help you prevent, if you're just tapping the screen itself, sometimes, particularly if you're doing nighttime photography, that can result in a lot of uh, kind of camera shakes. You might find you're getting blurry images. So sometimes that power button can be quite handy, okay? Now, beyond that then, uh, we move to Android. Um, again, you got your headphone socket, you got your power button, and the home button. Again, your power button can typically be set as a shutter release on your phones as well. Again, it has its front-facing camera and its back-facing camera, which you know you typically use for landscapes and, and all of that. Again, typically a higher resolution, so it is the one I recommend to use um, as many as often as you can. Okay. Next to that, again, you got your LED, your flashlight, 
like I said, the front facing camera, again, you'd be using that for Skype, Snapchat, um, or for typically for selfies as well. And likewise, volume control and your zoom button. Typically, again, you can use that as a uh, to zoom in on your images as well, okay? One thing that's very, very handy with Android phones is that you probably have a little slot there that you can add an additional micro SD card, okay? That is very, very useful if you're taking a lot of images on your phones and you're taking them at a higher resolution. It will take up a lot of space on your phone very, very quickly. So sometimes having that additional memory card will free up a lot of space. It gives you an awful lot more storage space. Now, lesson uh, seven, we're going to be talking about uh, backing our images up. So I know a lot of people with iPhones won't won't be able to add in this micro SD card, but we'll talk about backing up and storage in lesson seven again. Okay. Again, USB port very very handy if you want to download your your photos, maybe back them up on your PCs or your Mac. One thing's very very handy, guys. A great feature that you might not know about um, is the Again, the volume keys on the headphone, but again, using this headphone cable means you can take, you can use those volume keys on your headphone cable to take the shot as well, okay? So again, that can help you avoid that shutter shake you can get when you're tapping the, the shutter by hand, okay? Does that make sense, guys? So again, at this point, this is standard on most phones, and it can come in very, very handy in future lessons. One thing I'm going to say to you guys is please don't forget to clean your lens. Do think about the abuse that most of your phones go through, all right? They're in and out of pockets and bags, and that can accumulate a lot of dust and a lot of dirt, and it can deteriorate the quality of your photographs very, very quickly, okay? There is specific lens cloths designed to clean your lens without damaging them, so do try and use those instead of your T-shirt, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, if you're using your T-shirt, you can scratch your lens pretty easily with those kind of rougher materials. So see if you got one of these in your smartphone box and if not a glass cloth that you'd use for sunglasses or your regular glasses would work very very well and Roy you're saying you're guilty of that one <laughs> I think we all are I'll admit to being guilty for that one as well um, but look try and avoid it because it will really well scratch your lens uh, relatively quickly but all right guys look we do have a little bit more to go through on the lesson um, so again going to keep running through um, but just want to talk about setting up your cameras okay so the, the phone screen is going to typically be your viewfinder, okay? So it's going to show the scenes that you're pointing out. I know this probably all sounds very basic and simple, but it, it shows you obviously your scene, but then it, it'll also kind of give you an awful lot of controls, okay? And one thing that's quite nice about smartphones is the screens typically are actually quite a bit bigger than even your, your latest DSLR cameras. So it does make them great for composing our shots. But apart from obviously seeing the scene that you're about to photograph, it is also where you access different controls. And as smartphones, cameras are becoming more and more sophisticated, there is plenty of controls which could be a bit confusing at first. So rather than going through them all individually screen by screen, I'm going to introduce all these different features as we go through the course, okay? And that way it's much easier to see how they work in context. And I want to show you the result of changing these different features can be, okay? But there is a couple of features I want to talk about right now that are going to be very useful to setting up your camera, and that's resolution, flash, and burst mode. So resolution, okay, first thing to talk about that. Very, very important. Have you guys ever had images that looked great on your phones and even on your PCs and so then you decided to get them printed to only to find out that the print, is the, the quality uh, was, was, was really terrible? Okay, well look, more than likely that's to do with your file size. And obviously understanding the capabilities of your images and what quality files you have to work with is very, very important, okay? So you need to think digital photographs, they're made up of pixels. A pixel is basically a single block of color. And the resolution of an image is how many pixels are in a photograph or in a video. So this is known as megapixels in photography. So each pixel is a color or a tone. And it's a variation of colors that create the tone and the depth in an image, as the light and the shade, okay? 
Now, the more of these pixels we have, the image, the image has a higher quality. And in photography, if we have a high number of pixels in a photo, it can, you know, if, if your camera, for example, if your camera could capture a 20 megapixel image, that means it has 20 min, million pixels in a photo, okay? And you need to think of these as building blocks of your image. Now, obviously, the more bricks you have to build a house, the better and the bigger your house could be, okay? So think about it, right? I don't know if anybody's a builder uh, online with us tonight, but think if you're if you were a builder and you were given five thousand bricks to build a house, you know you might get a decent three bedroom house out of that. But what do you think? Like, what do you, if you have that same amount? If you have a, a you know five thousand bricks and you're now been asked to create to build a six bedroom house or even a ten bedroom house, do, do you think it's going to happen? What do you think the the house would be like? Basically, the house is going to fall apart, okay? You're not going to be able to do it. And the exact same thing happens with your images. If you have a small number of pixels to work with, it might be fine on screen, but you have to think about your phone and how small that screen actually is. If you then try and print it much larger, if you think this is an amazing landscape, I want to print this as a 16 by 20 inch print or a 40 by 50 centimeter print, it's substantial substantially bigger so the file is just going to break apart and not very very uh, not not look very very good does that make sense guys it is an important concept so i want to make sure you do all understand that fantastic all right and the one thing i mean it's very very important to go in and check your camera's resolution because majority of smartphone cameras they don't usually have the the maximum resolution set as your default option because those larger files, they will take up more space. So it is important to be aware of that as well. But because of that, most manufacturers will set that resolution at a smaller, uh, smaller file size. So resolution will give different options for size and shape aspect ratios, OK? So guys, look for your settings icon um, or a resolution symbol or anything that says image size. And once you find that and tap onto that, you might be presented with a menu that looks something like this, okay? And basically, rather than, you know, obviously take, I want you guys to be aware of this now, because rather than taking shots at smaller resolution in the whole course, and then finding out at the end that you could choose a, a higher resolution, want to bring this one up sooner rather than later, okay? Now, even though a photo with a higher resolution will need more memory, I'd always be setting it at the highest resolution available with the option to back up shots to, to, to cloud or maybe use an SD card. You know, with, with those options, there's no reason not to. But okay, so you can see there we've got our different, uh, you know, 2 megapixels, 3 megapixels, up to 15.5 or 20.7. You'll also see next with those numbers in brackets, that is your aspect ratio, okay? And the aspect ratio, that's your proportions of the image. So it's basically the width by the height. So obviously four by three is a little bit longer than a square image, but then you'll also notice a 16 by nine is, is, is a quite a wide shot, okay? So it's a little bit more like a panoramic, not quite, but it is certainly longer than a four by three image, okay? Now we'll go back and we'll talk about uh, aspect ratio in our composition lesson. But does that make sense, guys? Stein, this is for an iPhone as well. Bear with me a minute and I'll explain how you can do it on the iPhone, okay? okay. So the smaller the resolution, it just means that there's less information there. So it might be absolutely fine just to view on your phone itself or maybe even online. But if you ever decide you want to print these larger or if you want to do a lot of editing, you do need to, to photograph at those higher resolutions, okay? So if you go into your settings and look for any of these kind of symbols, um, if you can choose yourself what file size you want to take this at. Now, you know, you might not necessarily want to go to the absolute highest. It is what I personally would recommend, but it will depend on how much space you have on your phone. Then the next option there, your aspect ratio, it basically refers to what the, the length by the height of your image is, okay? Now, Excuse me, don't worry if you don't understand aspect ratio just now. We'll be talking about that in our compositional lesson. So then we're going to have actual examples. So I'll show you exactly what that is then, okay? But you, does everybody understand the resolution? And Chris, were you saying you don't have any of this on your phone? A lot of you might not have this on your phone as standard, but bear with me and I will explain how you can access it. You probably need to, to go to, to download a third party app and it will unlock it for you, okay? 
all right guys i have a list of different apps that will help you unlock this okay iphones i know you can't do it as standard you do absolutely need a third-party app if you're using an iphone most android and uh windows phones will allow you to change it without a third-party app but okay guys i know we've reached that hour mark so if you don't mind i just want to run through these last little bits and i know there's lots and lots of questions so i will come to those uh very very shortly for the moment i just want to talk to you about flash i want to talk to you about this one so early on as well because typically this is set as automatic on all of our phones okay it's typically the default setting and honestly, I think the quality of light these built-in flashes give, it's actually very, very poor. And to be honest, no matter what you're using, if, even if you're using a DSLR, a point-and-shoot camera, built-in flashes typically, they're, they're quite a poor quality of light. So I'm not a fan of them, to be honest, okay? But the flash icons uh, typically look, you know, like that little bolt of lighting. Lightning. If, so if you tap on that icon, you'll usually be given a number of options. Again, depending on what phones you're using, it might look different. So do please consult your manuals, okay? It might be a case of just keep tapping the symbol and you'll see the symbol changes. Or you might be presented with a drop-down menu like this one, okay? And if it's set to auto, if it has that little A beside the, the lightning bolt, that typically means auto, okay? And that means that the camera will automatically fire the flash if it thinks there's not enough light. And it does usually kick in at full power. I just want to give you an example of, I'm going to show you some, some examples with and without this flash, because I really am not a fan of it. I think it can be quite ugly at times, okay? And yes, Sally, you're agreeing with me on the, on this. You're saying it's very poor. Um, look, guys, I know we have reached that hour mark, so if you do need to go, I do understand, but I do really, really recommend checking out the recording tomorrow because this, again, is an important part of the, of the lesson. Um, apologies, I know there's a lot of housekeeping here, but I'm going to keep powering through this one, okay? Your next option typically might be fill flash. Um, and again, this one basically, you know, there, there may be enough light to take the shot, but it could be quite uneven. It might be dark in one part, it might be bright in another. Um, sometimes using this fill flash and bright sunlight can help to fill in shadows in a person's face, okay? And just to give you an example, again, this is where, you know, I was combining a bit of the, the natural, a bit of the ambient light with a little bit of fill flash. And this is the result I got this time. Next option is a red eye reduction. I'd imagine most of you probably are familiar with this. It's been on cameras for, well, I think for a very, very long time, okay? Um, this is basically, you know, this is a result you get when you don't have this setting. I think it's probably, you know, red eye has probably ruined an awful lot of shots of uh, nights out or maybe family events more than any other setting on cameras, okay? Um, or not having this. And this basically will happen with any camera where the flash and the lens are so close to each other. But manufacturers have come up with a way to reduce this. And it usually means the camera will fire a series of flashes before the shot is taken. And that's basically going to help people's eyes adjust and get used to bright light and therefore hopefully avoid this red eye kind of look, okay? Now, in all honesty, I, you know, I'm not entirely convinced. Sometimes, you know, some cameras will be better than others. It really, really, really does depend, to be honest. But now, as ironic as I might seem, I think the most important setting of all is the off setting, okay? So, guys, I mean, I would absolutely say to you, I mean, as much as uh, smartphone cameras, they have evolved, there is still limitations. And to be fair, that's absolutely true for any camera with a flash beside the lens, okay? This is important. Um, available light is much better than any flash. So, unless you have no other option, you should leave the flash turned off okay and this was the result I got with the flash turned off and yeah Magali you're agreeing with me on that one as well now finally one other option that you might have is the torch so you might have just used this on your phones in, in nothing to do with photography but most smartphones at this stage do have a torch option and this is going to shine a continuous light on your subject and it might seem like it's more relevant to videos than still photography but you could quite easily still use it for still photography. It's not going to be as strong as your automatic flash, but if there is a few people working together using torches on, on everybody's phone, well, then it can actually build up quite a bit of light in your area. So again, it, you know, it's not, it, it, 
don't dismiss that one altogether. Like I say, my preference and certainly my recommendation um, to start practicing with that flash off so you're really getting a better understanding of how to use your smartphones. And look, that's just a side by side comparison. To, I mean, can you see the, the big, the, the, like a massive difference that's really made? Like with the flash on, it's just washed out all the shadows. It's just shown us way too much. It all looks quite ugly and uh, just, just really, really not flattering at all. So um, certainly without the flash on, it was much, much better. Fantastic. All right, guys. One last thing. We're nearly, nearly done with the lesson itself. But one last feature I just want to introduce to you at the moment, okay, is burst mode. Have any of you guys ever used this burst or drive mode? A few people have. Okay, a lot of people say no. Okay, very, very mixed. But look, it's another really, really great feature on your smartphones. Um, perfect for getting a shot of very fast moving subjects, um, particularly in sports or wildlife uh, photography. And it might be as simple as holding the shutter butter button down until the moment has passed or you may need to go into your settings and enable this as a feature, okay? Um, a lot of smartphones won't have this enabled as uh, it does take up an awful lot of space on your smartphones again. Um, basically, this will actually give you the capabilities to take you know, anything from 10, 20 photographs within a maybe like one, two second, three second uh, time frame. Literally, you keep your button pressed down on the shutter button until you're you're, you're ready to stop photographing, okay? And yeah, Tobias, you're saying uh, to, uh, it's, it's great for fast-moving children. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, Miles, you're saying that you hold your screen to take a lot of pictures next to each other. And so yeah, very, very handy, okay? Now, I will still say to you, you know, be patient, patient and be ready for that kind of, you know, that, that magical kind of split second when everything comes together. Remember that, that decisive moment as well, okay? Do try and resist the temptation to shoot too many or certainly too much and shooting too soon or you could actually miss the moment if you're doing that okay it might be you know, a feature that you only need to use occasionally but it is great to know it's there if you do need it okay so think about you know if you're at a finish line to support uh, a friend or family member and just as they reach the finish line you can press the shutter and that taken maybe you know 20 30 shots in, in two three seconds and then you scroll through and you pick out the exact perfect moment okay now don't worry like i say if you can't find burst or drive mode not every smartphone manufacturer includes this because it can take up a lot of memory. Um, you might need to download it, or like I say, there is a lot of third-party apps that will allow you to. But just to kind of show you, um, give me one second, just an example. So imagine, like I say, been, been, been there at a sporting event and you want to capture, um, you know, really important moment. Just kind of show you, again, on burst mode, you can zap through and uh, capture a lot of really fast moving moments okay now you can see in this case we're, we're missing an awful lot of frames but the point is you don't need every single one of them by using burst mode it just enables you to capture those best moments very very quickly okay rather than trying to wait and sometimes you react too slowly and then you actually miss the moment all right, fantastic. And Mile, or, uh, Millie, you're saying sometimes the pictures do become extremely blurry with this function. It's probably more to do with your shutter speed and how fast that particular subject is moving. But we'll talk about that in lesson four and you'll understand why you're getting blurry images, okay? All right. So there we go, guys. <laughs> Let me do a quick, quick summary. I talked about different styles of photography and we've just kind of introduced the idea of getting to know your camera and running through a few uh, quite nice features that are there. So getting it set up for, for going forward. OK, so guys, let me just say really, really well done um, for, you know, attending the lesson and, and, and getting through the first lesson. You're obviously just laying the, the foundations and we will keep building on this, guys. I know there's going to be an awful lot of questions you have and these will be answered over the, the eight lessons. OK, so there's an awful lot more uh, to, to learn with all of this one okay to give you an idea of your next lesson lesson two we're going to be looking at seeing the world through your smartphone so we're going to be exploring how the camera sees in comparison to human vision and we're going to gain an understanding of different lens types that are available for smartphones 
And we'll talk about how the image is formed. Again, this is absolutely fundamental to photography in general, and smartphones are no exception. So we will be exploring that. 